Advent this year, Advent arrives this year on the eve of World AIDS Day. There are now more than 35 million people living with HIV, and only one third of them have access to antiretroviral therapy. Last year, 2.1 million were newly infected and 1.5 million died from AIDS. Advent this year arrives six days after a grand jury decided not to indict a white police officer in the shooting death of a black teenager. News media's coverage of the event, more accurately described as a feeding frenzy, has contributed to the aftermath of violence in the town and across our nation, proving once and for all that racism is very much alive and well in America. Advent arrives this year with the public beheading of Peter Kasich by the extremist group, which goes by the name of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, also known as ISIS, a splinter group from Al Qaeda. Peter, born and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, and the fifth Westerner to be executed by ISIS, served in Syria and Lebanon as a humanitarian aid worker. Two years ago, he had founded an organization which <coughs> provides refugees in Syria and Lebanon with medical assistance, supplies, clothing, and food. Now he is dead. Advent arrives this year following 23 shooting incidents at schools across the nation this year alone, resulting in seven deaths. Just five days ago, an 18-year-old boy was sentenced to three years in prison for making a series of threatening and harassing phone calls to schools nationwide that were the sites of school shootings, including Sandy Hook Elementary School and Arapahoe High School. Tempers flare and opinions polarize over whether guns are the problem or the solution to a world that seems to have gone crazy. And I believe that it's all nothing more than a gut-based reaction of fear and anger at world events that assault our senses every moment of every day thanks to the wonders of social media. It's an emotional response, not unlike the one of Isaiah in this morning's reading from the Hebrew Bible when he cried out to God, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire, fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your no, name known to your adversaries, translate our adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence, translate Advent finds us longing for peace and prosperity in a world besieged by war and famine and disease, and we cry out for God's inbreaking into our reality. Humankind is in such dire straits that we imagine nothing can alter the path we find ourselves on except a cataclysmic interruption by God in which we envision ourselves as the finger of God and as the instruments of God's divine intervention. Isaiah was writing in the midst of and out of the suffering of God's own people, Israel. Where are you, God? Why don't you act to fix this awful situation we find ourselves in? Why don't you come down and make things right? Where is God now? All questions we find ourselves asking even today on this Sunday of hope. 
Isaiah finds it troubling that God is not so visibly or powerfully present. God even appears to be absent, if not hiding. Isaiah struggles to reconcile the ancient stories of God's powerful presence with his present experience of God's absence. And so do we. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Come in all your power and glory to set things right. And Jesus responds, as he always did, with a story. In response to our prayer for earthquakes and fire, he responds with a story about a fig tree of all things. He says that when you see leaves begin to sprout on the limbs of the fig tree, you will know that he is near. And that's all. That's all he has to say in response to our litany of grief. That's all we are given as we cry out for rescue. Look for the tender sprouts of leaves on a fig tree, on a fig tree, he says. And we scratch our heads in puzzlement and feel he has either completely misunderstood our prayer or he mocks our heartache. But neither is the case. Jesus has not misunderstood our cries for divine intervention and he certainly doesn't ignore our pleas. He is trying to reveal himself and we aren't paying attention. Barbara Brown Taylor in her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, writes, while I am looking for something large, bright, and unmistakably holy, God slips something small, dark, and apparently negligible in my pocket. How many other treasures have I walked right by because they did not meet my standards? We see the heavens for God, we search the heavens for God's presence amidst the tragic deaths that have become a common occurrence. And we overlook God's presence in the ordinariness of every day. We call out for Jesus to come and rescue us and miss him in the sprouting leaves of a fig tree. Esther DeWall describes Celtic Christianity as a practice in which ordinary people in their daily lives took the task that lay to, lay to hand but treated them sacramentally as pointing to a greater reality which lay beyond them. It is an approach to life which we have been in danger of losing, she says, this sense of allowing the extraordinary to break in on the ordinary. Sylvia Maddox, who teaches in the Religious Studies Department of the University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, Texas, says, the Celtic prayers call us to look outside our window and discover the delight of an ordinary landscape transformed with a glimpse of God's glory. Suddenly, she says, the sun set over the soccer field, the cool breeze on the walk to, to school become reminders that there is no plant in the ground, but is full of God's virtue. There is no form in the strand, but it is full of God's blessing. There is no life in the sea. There is not a creature in the river. There is not in the firmament, but proclaims God's goodness. Patricia DeJong, senior minister of First Congregational Church in Berkeley, puts it this way. The coming of Advent jolts the church out of ordinary time with the invasive news that it's time to think about fresh possibilities for deliverance and human wholeness. At Advent, God's people summon the courage and the spiritual strength to remember that the holy breaks into the daily. When was the last time you experienced the holy breaking in to the daily? 
Lately, I've experienced it three or four times a week with an hour-long morning walk along the downtown Riverwalk. I know there are benefits to my physical health, such as improved blood circulation and muscle endurance. And there are certainly benefits to my psychological health as I empty myself of toxic thoughts that have become lodged within me. But the spiritual benefits. I hear God praised in the loud and raucous hymns sung by, with off-key abandon by the geese and ducks. I am intoxicated with God's presence in the heady incense blend of cedar and pecan trees. I feel the gentle touch of God's spirit with the river breezes call to prayer and the congregation of trees whispering a response of Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray on this first Sunday of Advent. And instead of an earth-shattering intervention in world events, God directs our attention to the ordinary. From the fig tree, learn its lesson, Jesus instructs us. May you experience the sacred and holy this season, not within the glitter and glamour of holiday commercialism, but in the ordinary, everyday things of life. Amen.